Amen. Thank you, Gerald. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open it up to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5 is where we'll be this morning. This is the second sermon on Advent. We started last week uh, from, it seems like a strange passage from Malachi. And there was a passage of judgment pointing toward the coming Christ. And uh, this morning we re reach once again into the Old Testament, Micah chapter 5. And there you find a more familiar passage. You, you at least have heard this before, even if you might have a hard time finding the book of Micah. You've heard this passage before. This is where we get the, um, the song, Little Town of Bethlehem. In fact, we sang just a little bit of it as uh, Gerald led us this morning about Bethlehem where Christ would be born. And here's where it comes from in Micah chapter 5. So if you found that, won't you stand? We'll read together God's word. Micah chapter 5. <clears throat> I'll read verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If you're a guest with us today, this is what we do on Sunday mornings. Open the Word, and then we will go expositionally through it. We'll read the passage, and then just deal with what does the passage say. In fact, in February, we'll be reading through the book of Romans, and what we'll do is take a passage from Romans every Sunday, and then just talk about what does the Bible say. Micah, uh, Micah chapter 5, verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Grass with us and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. <clears throat> now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With the rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah from you, Verse 2 is an important verse. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. Therefore he, shall, therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. He shall stand and... Shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And let's just take that last little phrase of verse 5. And he shall be their peace. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you have given us chance to come and worship this morning that we have the privilege and ability and the place to do so. So I ask that as we read your word and as we think on the coming of Christ, that our hearts might rejoice in the goodness of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Here we are at Christmas and you normally will reflect on the New Testament. That's where you go to read the Christmas story. You find it in Luke and also in Matthew. And when you read the story found in Matthew, when the New Testament writer Matthew writes his gospel, he tells of the birth of Jesus. And he tells of the birth of Jesus in a place called Bethlehem. He talks about the Magi, we call them wise men, coming from the east and coming to Jerusalem. And you remember the story when they came to Jerusalem and the wise men met with Herod and they went to Herod and they asked King Herod, Tell us, where is he who was born king? We've seen his star, and we've come to worship him. Well, go ahead, when you read Matthew, Matthew says that Herod uh, was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And I'm sure they were. And so Herod gets all the wise men together, um, all of the scribes, all of the Pharisees, gets the scholars together, and he asks them, what are those wise men talking about? And all of the scholars take Herod to this passage that we read this morning. And they read this to Herod about Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a nowhere town and a nowhere village. Bethlehem is the place where the eternal plan of God would be revealed. Now, if you're going to celebrate Advent rightly, if you're going to know Jesus thoroughly, if you're going to worship Him genuinely, then we must see the saving beauty 
of Jesus, the coming King. And how God the Father, through the power of the Spirit, magnifies His own glory in the prophecy in Micah chapter 5, and then in the fulfillment of the coming Christ, and then how all of this reminds us of God's good grace to us in Jesus. In fact, I'd like to say it like this. If I were titling uh, this sermon or giving it a theme, it would be Advent. Advent is God's grace on full display. Advent is God's grace. On this is really nice being on the floor, by the way. I really like this. This feels, uh, think we could do this on a Sunday morning? No, you think? Okay, no, maybe not. Well, let's go through and go. I have several points. I don't imagine I'll get through all of them today, but let's just go as far as we can go. Okay, here's the first one. Number one. <clears throat> Advent is Christ lifting the curse. Why do we celebrate Christmas like we do? Why do we think about the coming of Jesus? It is because Jesus has come to lift the curse. The curse I'm talking about is the one that fell on mankind when we fell into sin through our first parents, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 3. That is the curse. That curse is not only with people. That curse has fallen on all of creation. Part of the curse this morning is that on a Sunday morning, it is a blizzard in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's always a Sunday, by the way, when bad weather comes. Well, let's take a look at Bethlehem. There in verse 1, Bethlehem is a nothing town. It's a village, really. Verse 1, and then in verse 2, a little town of Bethlehem. And the fact that Jesus would be born in such a forgotten place is a reminder of what we believe as Christians, that we are justified by faith in Jesus apart from the law. What I mean is that that God doesn't give salvation based on merit. Here's where I get that. When you put in contrast, in stark relief, when you put in contrast the littleness of Bethlehem with the greatness of the ruler to come, what you find there is grace. It reminds us as, as Christians that that our religion, what we live, that the gospel is actually grace. Not a works-based religion. It is a grace-based religion. We do good works. Hopefully you're living out in such a way people know you're a Christian, but you're not doing that trying to earn God's favor. You're doing that because you have received God's favor. Grace. What God has done to save sinners through Christ when I say what he's done, his perfect life, his atoning death, his resurrection, it is a reminder that the God we worship is a God of grace. That is one word, grace. I would give another word, and that is the word plan. 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 It's good for us to remember that God has a perfect and complete plan. Now, most of us, if I were to say, raise your hand if you think God has a plan for your life, you would say, I believe God has a plan for my life. Because it sounds good to say. But it's very difficult to actually live when you find yourself in a circumstance that you hate. One of the things about Bethlehem and Jesus being born there, it reminds us that God works through a plan. And that's why we go to the Bible, because God has revealed to us in the Bible part of His plan. Now, we don't have it all. He has revealed to us enough for us to know Him, to be saved, to be convicted of our sin, to turn from it and turn to Christ. But you have God's revealed plan in front of us. And here in, in this plan, in the Old Testament, His Word, He points us to Christ in multiple Old Testament passages. In fact, um, one of the reasons I would disagree with someone like Andy Stanley, who is a preacher in Atlanta, uh, part of what Andy Stanley has said recently has, has been that Christians should unhitch themselves uh, from the Old Testament, which I think is a tragic mistake. Because the Old Testament, there we find in embryonic form, in prophetic form, what's going to happen in God's plan. And he points to us, points us here to the birth of Jesus. So the Old Testament in multiple ways, in fact, Gerald read from Isaiah 9 this morning, multiple ways point us to the coming Christ. And one of the ways that we are pointed to the coming Jesus is the life of a man named David. David was 
Israel's greatest king, wrote the book of Psalms. You can take Psalms and just read them as part of your praying. If you want to, this year, go through and learn how to pray, I would say read two or three Psalms in the morning and pray what you find there in the book of Psalms. David was Israel's greatest king. And David would be the forerunner, the foreshadowing of a Messiah who would be still greater to come. A Messiah who actually would be the true and better David. David was there in the Old Testament to show us Jesus, that Jesus was the fulfillment of who David is. And David, being born in Bethlehem, was a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. Now, David can't save us. What David, King David, does is actually point us to the one who can save us, Jesus. That's the plan. Let me give you another word. Um, another word I would suggest is the word redemption. Word redemption. Redemption. If you've been coming to Hickory Grove for some time, we spent two years in the book of Genesis. It took us two years to get through it. And this last year was largely dominated by the end of the book of Genesis dealing with Jacob and uh, his sons, 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if you will think back with me about Jacob, <clears throat> you'll remember that the very worst thing that happened to Jacob, he had lots of bad things happen, but the very worst thing that happened to Jacob was his wife, the one he loved so much, remember her? Rachel, he loved her so much and she actually died in childbirth, giving birth to his youngest son, Benjamin. And you'll remember that that happened in a place called Bethlehem. So for the people of Israel, Jacob is Israel. The very worst thing that happened in their history happened in a place called Bethlehem. We close the Old Testament with that being what we know about Bethlehem. We come to Micah. Mike, Micah points us to a day that in Bethlehem, not the worst thing that's going to happen, but the very best thing that could ever happen to God's people is the coming Savior being born in Bethlehem. It's redemption. It's the way, um, remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 and following? It's a, good, it's a good passage, by the way, to write down somewhere. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28, and 29 or so says this. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that. Why does God save us through grace? So that human beings might not boast in the presence of God. Advent. Advent reminds us that Christ has lifted the curse. You ride back uh, home today in the snow and driving, whatever's going to be falling. You do so carefully. Watch what you're doing. Go slowly. Give room. And you remember all that around you is because of the curse. You'll see cars on the side of the road, accidents that happen. It's because of the the sin that, our crea that God's creation groans under. And Jesus came to lift the curse. That's Advent. Let me give you another thing about Advent. I'll give this, uh, make this a second point. Number two. <clears throat> Advent is Christ and His kingdom. Christ and His kingdom. Go with me to the text there in, in uh, Micah chapter 5, verses 1, and drop down to verse 2. And about midway through verse 2, there is the phrase that speaks of Jesus going forth. Let me read it to you. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. Listen to the phraseology here. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. From you. This one will go forth for me. Now, who is speaking there in verse 2? In that passage, from you shall go forth one for me. 
That is God the Father speaking about God the Son. God the Father who has planned redemption speaking about God the Son, the Redeemer. That the Redeemer will come to mankind and keep looking at verse 2. Notice why the Redeemer is coming to mankind. I will send him and he will come for me. Now let's think about modern Christianity. How we think about salvation, what it means to be a Christian. Oftentimes we think about Jesus dying for us. That Jesus died to save us. So that, that we can have all we want. And, and we forget that that certainly is true. We do believe Jesus died for us, but that's not all of the story. That Jesus loves us, he comes after us, he sacrificed for us so that you and I might be able to actually now bring honor and glory to God. So that the sacrifice on, on the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, is not only to save sinners, it is also for God's glory. Somehow we've fallen into this lopsided view of salvation, a misconception of, of why God saves us through Jesus Christ. It, it is not just to keep us out of hell. Thank God that in Christ you don't go to hell. That is a wonderful, beautiful truth that we cling to, right? But that's not only when God saves us in Christ, through Christ, He saves us for all eternity so that our lives for all eternity might actually reflect honor back on Him. There's not one part of your life that God doesn't claim as His own. There's not one relationship that God doesn't claim as His own. There's not one marriage. There's not, if you are working somewhere, you're an employee. God claims that what you're doing, you're doing that for him. According to this text in front of us, God's purpose in sending Jesus Christ to provide salvation, according to verse 2, is He does that for His glory. And if you're living in some way, some lifestyle that is not reflecting God's glory, then you're missing the entire point for salvation. One of my, uh, one of my fears of, of people joining a church is that people will join a church and never actually meet the Savior, never be transformed from the inside out. It burdens me because all of you here, you, you were actually made for God. And if you are in Christ, He saves you. He certainly does that to keep you from going to hell. Yes, we believe that. But it's not just that you don't miss hell. It is that you are redeemed and your life now reflects the glory of God. That's why we seek to live to the glory of God. You were bought, verse 2, for Him. I'll give you another thing to consider about Advent. I'll go to a third point. I think I have five or six. You might just get three or four. We'll see. Here's number three. Advent tells us and reminds us that Jesus is Lord. What we are reminded here at Christmas time. Advent, Advent is nothing more than a word that means Christ's coming. Advent reminds us that Jesus is Lord. Go with me again to verse 2. The phraseology in verse 2 is very important as God speaks about, God the Father speaks about God the Son. Notice verse 2, one will go forth from me. Go with me to verse 2. From me, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler. See that word? Ruler in Israel. Ruler. I would circle that word ruler. Ruler means the one in charge. Ruler. The, the one calling all of the shots. Here's the picture from the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. The picture from the mouth of God the Father about God the Son is of Jesus sitting on the throne as king. And as king... All of his people actually obeying what he says. The, the first point of verse 2 is, is for me. So that gives us motive. We know why God is doing it. That, that's the why of life. Why do we live our lives like we do? We do that to reflect honor back to God. Well, this point here in verse 2, this actually speaks, him, him as ruler, this speaks to our actual obedience to the Lord's directives Understanding what God calls us to do and, and, and the, the commands that God gives us, His law provides for us. In fact, let's, let's press on that a little further. 
Obedience to Christ is the number one indicator that you actually know the Lord Jesus. If you claim to be a Christian, the number one indicator that you actually are a Christian is the fact that you are seeking to live out a life that honors Jesus. Isn't that what Jesus said? Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple if you do not give up everything you have. But what's he saying there? He's saying that you, when you come to Christ and you receive him as Lord Savior, you give him complete, total, dominating control of your life. It's the, it's the Lordship of Jesus that actually rules our day-to-day -day affairs. I mean, that's what this is about. Advent is about the inbreaking. It's about Christ, His kingdom, breaking in. This, this, and this always brings up a question that is uh, debated among Christians about what does it look like to be a Christian? Uh, can, can you be a Christian? Can you be converted and not actually be changed? And, and the language of the New Testament is, is language that... that that demands that there is a transformation. That uh, when Jesus talks about being born again, when, from going from death to life, there, there's, there's a dramatic transformation. Can you actually uh, have Jesus as Savior and Him not be Lord? And, and really when you read the New Testament, there's just no category for that. That's, a, that's an American-made category that we've imposed on, on the Bible. The Bible has no category for that. We've so cheapened, we forget the, that the grace of God, we, we cheapen it to the degree that you could just live any kind of way. It's why I'm against, um, it's why I'm against things like, um, that's why I hate things like being at a service and at the end, after not hearing anything about the gospel, uh, have people raise your hands with your eyes closed. So I don't hear me doing that. That's why I'm against things like um, uh, mass and spontaneous baptisms. Because I think that you, you, there's not any thought in that. There's, there's no call for uh, the lordship of, of Jesus. That's why I think that salvation, we oftentimes cheapen the grace of God. When you're, when you're turning away from a life of sin and death, and when you're turning to a life of, of, of joy and forgiveness in Christ and submission and obedience to King Jesus as Lord, that's what Advent is about. Well, with that in mind, let me give you a fourth um, consideration for Advent. I think this is number four. <clears throat> it is? Okay. Advent is the declaration of victory. Advent is declaring Jesus has won. Let me, let me take you back to verse 2. We've stayed there a good bit, but there, there's a whole lot there. <clears throat> let me go to verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. We talked about that. Now listen to the description here whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. Think, I would circle that in my Bible. From old, ancient of days. Micah is a contemporary of Isaiah. Gerald read from Isaiah this morning. There's a reason they're, they're, they're preaching about the same time. And this passage right here in Micah chapter 5 is written hundreds of years before the actual birth of Jesus. And it's prophesying about him being born in Bethlehem. But it also says in this verse, verse 2, that he existed in eternity past. Now, Bethlehem would be the scene of Jesus uh, coming, him being revealed in the flesh, the incarnation. But let's not forget, he existed before the baby in the manger. Remember how John does it in, in John's prologue? In John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Was not anything made that was made without Him. 
When, when Jesus on earth, as a, as a grown man, when Jesus in his teaching, he would speak to the Jewish leaders and he would tell them, before Abraham was, Abraham the patriarch, before Abraham was, I am. Here, here's a good reminder for us that his ironclad kingdom has existed before time and eternity. It is immovable, unshakable, and victorious, and it gives me great confidence. That's motivation enough for me to want to get out on Sunday morning when it's snowing and come and worship the Lord's day. The kingdom we belong to does not rise and fall on the politics we see, doesn't on, on the stock market. It's not affected by uh, our president's Twitter. It's, it's not shaken in any way. Not the housing market or any market. But when you get a sense of, when you and I get a sense of our citizenship, where your allegiance is above all other allegiances, that your allegiance is to Jesus Christ, then it makes other stuff not as consuming as it might would have been. To know that you are a part of a kingdom that's invincible, that gives you great comfort in life, it gives us great comfort in, in death. One of our dear members passed this morning around 4.30, and Rick Blasey was there at the hospital with the family and was there when he died and prayed with the family. And we can pray with, with confidence and with a, with, a, with a deep joy knowing that to be away from the body is to be with Jesus. That, that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of His holy ones. Let me give you one last. I, I'll make it one last. There's a fifth one, but let me skip it. I'm going to go to the very, very end. And that is that Advent means peace. means peace. There is a good bit in verse 2 and 3 and really in verse 4 about Jesus as the shepherd. I would just encourage you... It's good for you to do some work yourself. Go and look at verse 4 and just read it about Jesus as shepherd. But in the very first phrase of verse 5, notice there in verse 5, it reminds us that Advent, the coming of Jesus, actually means peace. Right? Do you see it? It's right there. And He, this one, and He, Jesus, shall be their peace. This is the very first phrase of verse 5 because after that, the topic changes. And that little word, that little statement there about Jesus, it speaks multiplied volumes of what Jesus actually does when He becomes your Savior. That word peace, you've heard it before. It's the, it's the word for wholeness, the word for wellness, for healing, for calmness, peace. That word for peace means there's an end to hostility. The coming of Jesus, Advent, means that there will be a change in how you relate to God and how you relate to other people. Jesus comes and He forevermore puts an end to the punishment and the wrath of God. People ask, do you believe in a wrathful God? I believe that the God of the Bible is revealed as one that hates sin and will punishment in His justice and righteous anger and wrath. And this promise tells me that Jesus comes to stand in the place of sinners and receive that. He takes all of the punishment that God will pour out on all sinners that will ever be saved and then gives them, gives us, has given me peace. It is a reminder. You, you will hear the language sometime uh, sometimes you'll hear people say um, about people that are not Christians, they are far from God. And, and they certainly are. I would prefer to say that, that when you're not in Christ, there is, a, there is a war. You're an enemy. You're not just far from God, you're an enemy. That because of your sin, you've declared war on God. Be because of His holiness, and you as a sinner, He's declared it on you. And in Jesus, Jesus comes and, and there stands. And He becomes our peace. And in Jesus Christ, the war between God and man is over. You have to reach way back into the Old Testament. You'll remember in Genesis chapter 6, 7 and 8, when God saw man's sin and how his only desire was for violence, and he sent a great flood that wiped out.
all of mankind. And you remember that, that Noah and his family were preserved in an ark. That ark was a picture of Christ. And after the waters receded, you remember the sign that, that God put in the sky? Rainbow. I'd like to see one of those today. The rainbow. That bow in the sky is a symbol that God has put that weapon of war, the bow. Think about a bow and arrow. God has put the bow in the sky to say, there is peace. Jesus said it like this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I will give you rest for your souls. In Christ, Advent reminds us, He is our peace. Will you join me as we pray together? This morning as uh, we get ready to pray, I'm going to ask Justin to come and lead us in a word of prayer. And as he does, uh, after he prays, we'll sing a couple of songs. If you, if you just wouldn't mind, as you think of it, you, you pray for us as we travel uh, to main campus and get ready to preach a sermon there. Justin, would you come and lead us?